All right, so last week we did not get through all of chapter 11 because it was a big chapter. So we are going to try to get through the last 10 verses of chapter 11 and then uh, see how much, if not all, of chapter 12 that we can get through. Uh, just by way of reminder, what we're walking through with chapter 11 is what I call the role models of faith. The, the whole point here is that the author of Hebrews has kind of taken a little bit of an aside during chapter 11 from the main flow of thought. We had, you know, up till, you know, the first nine and a half chapters, we had the theology lesson, right? We had how the old covenant is inferior to the new covenant, new covenant is better. And then we took a shift uh, where now we started talking about the practical applications. So the last part of the book is all about the practical aspects of it. How do you apply this to your life? And the author decided one way to do that was to take what is now chapter 11, and just give a lot of examples of Old Testament figures who were commended for their faith. And the overarching point of all of them was that they were all privy to a promise, a promise of, you know, a, the, the next life, an eternal promise that none of them saw come to fruition. Not a single one. They all died before Jesus was even born. So they didn't see any of it come about. And yet, they still lived their lives in faith. They were, by looking forward to that promise, even though they had to endure all sorts of stuff in their lives, all sorts of, a lot of them, and we'll see even more tonight, uh, a lot of them some very negative experiences, what helped them to persevere was by focusing on having that eternal perspective, focusing on that promise. But we talked about how amazing that level of faith is because it's a promise that they had to know, or at least have reason to believe, they might never see in their lifetime, but they're supposed to live their entire life just knowing it's going to happen, because God said it's going to happen, so it's going to happen. Um, and so obviously these are examples for us, which is what we'll get into when you get into chapter 12. But let's finish these last 10 verses of chapter 11 about these role models, these examples from the Old Covenant that the author of Hebrews is lifting up. And what we had talked about at the end of last week was Joshua, Joshua in the Battle of Jericho, and how absolutely silly they must have looked just walking around a city, you know, once a day for seven days, and the seventh day just walk around the city seven times. And I got I to gotta imagine the people in Jericho just looking out and laughing at them. This is an army? What are they doing? You know, they're, they're doing nothing. Um, and then, much to their surprise, oh, look, all our walls are gone. All right, and so we, uh, we saw that example of faith, of doing something that really should have no connection to their superiority in battle whatsoever, but God said to do it. They trusted God. They did it. And so we're still today, in verse 31, we're continuing that story of Joshua. If you haven't, aren't familiar with the book of Joshua, it's not too long of a book, but it is a very good book, and uh, I had to write a paper on it in seminary, but it, uh, not the whole book, but uh, some of the themes from it. It's a, I really enjoy it. It's a book of history, but there's a lot of good, valuable lessons in there. And here's one of the stories that might not be as familiar to you. You might have heard. It's all about the assault, if you want to call it that, on Jericho. What happened is beforehand, well, here verse, we'll read it first. Verse 31 says, By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. This is all still a Jericho story. In anticipation of the attack on Jericho, Joshua actually sent some spies into the city, all right, to figure out how fortified were they, how powerful are they, all right? Well, those spies were going to get caught when they came across this prostitute, Rahab, and she actually hid them. She hid them so that they would be allowed, able to escape and get back and report back to, the, uh, to Israel's army. And when she's doing this, one of the things she said is this. She said, I know that the Lord has given you this land, for the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. She's acknowledging that, there, look, there's one God and it's yours, right off the bat. And she's taking action to show her faith in God, trusting that she knows the city's lost, but that if she helps God's people, then God would spare her and her family from the destruction that was inevitably going to come. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. Now, what's interesting about Rahab compared to everybody else in this list in chapter 11 is number one, well, she was a prostitute, right? And number two, she was a Gentile. She was not Jewish, 
all right? And yet, here we see her name listed amongst all these role models of faith being offered up to these Jewish Christians, right? More so, if you look at the single most interesting passage in Scripture outside of, you know, Leviticus, um, Matthew chapter 1, which is the gene, one of the genealogies of Jesus. Uh, I'm being somewhat sarcastic. Everybody loves reading so-and-so begat so-and-so begat so-and-so, who then begat somebody else. Um, but in Matthew chapter 1, verse 5, Rahab's name appears, all right? Rahab is in Jesus' genealogy. All right. She is actually King David's great grandmother. All right. And she's and of course Jesus was descended from David. So she she is an ancestor of Jesus himself. So look, and this is another lesson we always hear a lot of people in the Jewish culture at the time thought of themselves as being this privileged nation and they were, but they also didn't seem to understand that they were a chosen nation just because I mean God could have chosen anybody. He could have made any nation he wanted to, all right? So they, it wasn't, they weren't chosen because they were somehow better or special. They were chosen just because they were chosen. And if God wanted to use someone else, God can use someone else. Why? Because we're all God's children in that respect. Everyone's made in the image of God. And this is part of what he's illustrating here with Rahab and using Rahab as one of these examples of faith, even though she was not Jewish in heritage. All right. And then verses 32 and 34, 32 through 34, is the, the catch-all, okay? It's like there's so many more stories we could tell, but that's what the rest of the Bible is for, right? And the, the author says here, and what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Um, again, if you want to learn more detail about all these people that are listed, there's a really good book I can refer you to. Um, but this, I mean, just in summary, Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah, they were all judges. If you're not familiar with the period of judges, you know, Israel came and they conquered the land, and for a while they were ruled by judges, not kings. And of course, they looked at all the lands around them and they said, oh, we want a king. We want a king. Everybody else has a king. God, why can't we have a king? And God said, why don't you just listen to me? And, but they whined and they whined and they whined. And so he gave him King Saul. That did not work out very well. Okay. But because they, they chose King Saul represented everything they expected in a king. He was big. He was mighty. He looked strong. That's great. And then who was the next king after Saul? Anybody know? Take a guess, you'll probably be right. Most famous king in all of Israel. David, David yes. <laughs> David came in. Anybody know what David looked like? He was the runt of the litter. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so again, God was subverting expectations, saying what you look to is not what I look to. You know? But anyway, these were all judges, so they're before the era of the kings of, of Saul and David and Solomon. Um, and of course, David is listed there as well. David was a great king, uh, described as you know, after God's own heart. Samuel was a prophet. He was actually the last judge because he's the one that anointed David, the last judge and prophet. All of them, all these people, and we could list a million more, you know, undertook a very, very difficult tasks uh, on behalf of God. They had their faith tested. None of them were perfect, though. And that's an important lesson to keep in mind. These people are being held up because they did things that are certainly can be good examples of faith that we should be modeling. That does not necessarily mean we should be modeling everything they do. Can anybody familiar at all with David's story? What did David do? Well, he battled Goliath, but how about when he was king? I'm looking for something he did that was not a good thing. We could sum it all up with adultery and murder. I mean, that's basically it. I mean, those are pretty big ones, aren't they? Yeah, he saw another woman, he's Bathsheba, she's looking pretty nice. Oh, she's married? No problem, I'm king. I'm just going to, you know, take her husband, who's out fighting my wars for me, um, and uh, command my generals to put him on the front lines. Not just put him on the front line, I was actually joking with, I think it was Pastor Jay about this last week. It's like, you just put him on the front line. He made him the front line, all by himself. It's like, everybody's like, oh, he's the front line, and then everybody else withdraw. So, you know, that, that's murder. So it was adultery and murder, then he married her. Um, so, yeah, so obviously none of these people were perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but none of us are, and that's, there's a lesson in that as well. 
All right, going on to verse 35. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. All right? There's several examples of you know, mothers receiving their children back from, the, from, from death. I've got the widow of Zarephath here, which is in 1 Kings 17. The Shunammite woman in 2 Kings uh, chapter 4. Um, they each received children back from the dead. So the, I, this is a, a more than one, this is a more general statement here. Uh, but what's interesting about this verse, and what I want to draw your attention to, is the shift kind of in focus now, where it talks about there were others who were tortured. All right. So we've given you this whole list of these great accomplished people, all these wonderful examples of faith. Um, and sometimes what do you get for it? God never promised you, contrary to what some people will say in some pulpits today, all right, God never promised that if you come to faith, your life is going to be all hunky-dory, peaches and roses, chocolate cream pie, you know, I, and I haven't had chocolate cream pie in a while, so, sorry, it's on the mind. Um, and if there was any of the pie social after Thanksgiving, it was gone by the time I got there. I'm not bitter. Um, so he, he never said that, all right? As a matter of fact, we see examples where the exact opposite is what happened. It's not just the people of the faith did undergo these bad times. Sometimes they underwent this torture in these bad times specifically because of their faith. It was their faith that got them into that predicament in the first place. All right? But all the more reason why, again, this is fitting in with the recurring theme of chapter 11, you keep that eternal perspective. You understand that whatever happens in this life is a blip on the radar screen compared to what's gonna, what, what you're going to have to be able to do to spend eternity. Right? And so you want to be keeping that eternal perspective, and that will help you persevere through the slings and arrows that this life will throw at you. All right. Then verses 36 through 38 gives us some examples, uh, more, more examples than just the, the torturing. Again, speaking of these people of faith, it says some faced jeers and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. Anybody volunteering for that? Looking forward to it? Anybody realize that you might be called to that? Are you willing to be called to that? You don't have to answer that out loud, but you should be thinking about it. Right. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two, and not in a magician way where they could put them back together again. Okay? They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. Again, this is a catch-all provision where we're talking about all these other people as a whole. There are some things in here that we can point out are referring to specific people. Uh, church tradition says Isaiah, the prophet, was actually sawn in, sawn in two while he was hiding in a tree uh, because King Manasseh was upset because Isaiah predicted the fall of the temple. He didn't like that, so he wanted to, Isaiah executed. Isaiah's hiding in a tree, cuts the tree in half with Isaiah in it. Um, so this is most likely a specific reference to Isaiah. Again, remember who the author is writing to. The author is writing to Jewish Christians who would have been familiar with these stories already. So he's not going to take the time to explain all of them. Even when we've been going through chapter 11, we've, we've been talking about you know, this story and that story. But for the most part, I've been telling you the stories. The details of the stories aren't there. Why? It just, it's just a passing comment about this, that, or the other, with the exception of Abraham, which the author went into more detail about. Um, because the author knows that the reader is already going to be familiar with these stories because of their Jewish heritage, because of their Jewish upbringing. All right. And verse 39, these were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. All right. And this is the point that we've been talking about. This is the overarching theme of chapter 11. All right. Yes, obviously God made other promises to them, and some of the promises they, they did, some of these people did see fulfilled, the, the smaller promises, we'll say it. But that's not the point the author's trying to make and the emphasis that they're trying to put on here in, in chapter 11. The author here is saying, but there was one big overarching promise. There was the big one, the eternal promise of what the next life held for them. None of them saw that happen. But they not, also, they lived their lives just, it was almost like it was just a foregone conclusion for a lot of these folks. I mean, we all struggle and I can't tell you, I mean, Christians wondering about the truth of what they believe from time to time throughout their lives, especially in the hard times, that's a natural thing. It, it does happen. Um, and this is a matter of how you handle it. 
Uh, but what we see here is all these people that are being held up, it's almost like that never really seemed to happen with them, even when they're going through the tough times, even when they mess up, even when David committed murder and adultery when he was confronted with his own sin, he realized what he did was wrong, all right, and he steered himself back onto the correct path because he was living his life always kind of with this understanding. It was just a foregone conclusion. Well, yes, God said this, therefore... That is true. That will happen. Even if I don't see it happen, I know it's going to happen. And lastly, verse 40, since God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. God had planned something better. And they all knew that God had planned something better, even though none of them knew what that something better was going to be exactly. That something better was the new covenant. That something better was Jesus. All right. Keep in mind what we talked about when the author spent a whole bunch of time in the, uh, the whole theology lesson part of this book explaining. All right? That all those Old Testament sacrifices, were they, any, were they actually paying for people's sins? No. They weren't actually paying for anything. Right? They were meant to illustrate the severity of sin so people would take it seriously. And they were meant to point towards the, the ultimate sacrifice in Jesus so people would kind of be able to recognize that when it came. But they, those sacrifices in and of themselves weren't going to atone for anything. All right? Well, so how did these people of faith get saved? Well, even them, even they were saved as a result of what Jesus did. Jesus' sacrifice was good not just for all the sins that were happening in the world when he, when he died and for everything going forward. It was also sufficient for the, to atone for all the sins that happened beforehand. And, but the, the criteria we talk about, how are we saved? We are saved by grace through faith, right? That's the key, is do you have faith? Well, obviously the specifics of that faith are, might look a little different now that we're kind of looking at Jesus' sacrifice in the rearview mirror as opposed to them who were anticipating it. But faith, the key component of faith, of trust in God, was always the criteria. Always. And that Old Testament, that's why we have all this whole chapter of people who showed their faith. They didn't know the specifics of what Jesus' sacrifice was going to look like, but they still trusted God. And because they trusted God, when Jesus did come and die on the cross, his, his payment was sufficient to atone for their sins as well, even retroactively. All right. Um, the, this slide was more a matter of, uh, it was a note that I, I read in one of the commentaries that I was looking at, um, and it's more of a cautionary note, and we see this in a lot of other contexts as well. Um, the Christian faith was never meant to be lived out in isolation. You, you hear people talk about how, you know, well, I don't need, I don't go to church, I got my own relationship with God. Um, yeah, no, you probably don't. I mean, I, I hate to put it so I don't know what's going on in their heart, but the fact of the matter is, whatever that faith may be that you think you have personally is not what God's asking you to do. Because, well, yes, we are supposed to have a personal relationship with God. It was never meant to end there, to only be a personal relationship with God. What we see in this very last verse in chapter 11 is that we are unified, not just with our fellow believers today, but in a very real sense, we're unified and of one church with the believers from hundreds and thousands of years ago. And that's because the Christian faith is supposed to be one of community. We're supposed to be all in this together to quote High School Musical. Okay, I won't start dancing or singing. Um, and we see that as a recurring theme throughout. All right. So if you, if you ever are tempted to kind of say, you know what, I don't need the church community. I can just do it on my own. Or something that you know people might be surprised to hear me say, given my job. Um, but if I if I just could just feel like oh, maybe I don't need to come to church, I'll just sit home and just as my regular habit now, I'll just start watching it online every week. All right, that's not what God's asking of you to do. Online worship is great for what it is for people who are unavailable or can't get in for one reason or another, or you're out of town or you missed it and you want to catch up. I mean, there's lots of great, wonderful things about it, but it was never meant to be a complete substitute to coming in person. That's not the point. That's contrary to God's word. Chapter 12, verse 1. All right. What's the first word? Therefore, which means what? What's that? Here's the deal. There you go. Remember, we've talked about, and uh, back when we first started the study in some of the earlier weeks, that there are certain words that you could circle, highlight, whatever, that 
help you, this is like reading comprehension on the SAT, all right? This is one of those key words you look at to help you interpret the Bible, to help you understand what's going on, because you can see, you can follow the structure of the author's argument, the author's flow of thought. So now we get a therefore, so that tells us, okay. So now what the author's do, doing is telling us the main point they want us to get out of all the stuff they just said before. So that's why, that's why whoever decided to make these chapter and verses, sometimes I'm critical of the way they did it, this time they got it right. Because they want to take everything that was said in chapter 11, and now we're going to start chapter 12 by saying, and here's the point of it all. all right? Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. We see that race imagery come up an awful lot in the Bible. I mean, the, the, our lives are compared to a race. Um, the, the, such a great cloud of witnesses. In other words, those great cloud of witnesses are all these people that went before us that we were just described in chapter 11, right? We've got all these uh, people that are witnesses, not just that have already finished the race and looking down upon us, but witnesses in, in the sense that they are witnessing to us. They're, by, by their behavior, by their actions, what they did, their actions could witness to us about what we should be doing as well. Um, but here's the neat thing about the race imagery. Let us throw off everything that hinders. Does anyone want to volunteer to get up here and demonstrate the way people would have run a marathon or a long race at the time that this was written? No, you're reading the screen, aren't you? <laughs> Nobody wants to volunteer for that. They would run them naked because they really wanted to strip anything that could slow them down. And clothing is something that's extra weight, and it could be baggy, and it could slow you down. And so at the, in order to run these races, they would take everything off to remove anything that could entangle them. And so that's another aspect of this race imagery that the author is trying to get at. When you're talking, looking at your life as a race... All right, as your faith journey, as, your, as a race, where you're trying to reach a finish line, all right, what is it that is hindering you? What can you strip off? We all have something, all right? And this is, this is one of those gut check moments where you've got to be honest with yourself. What is it? And it's not easy. All right, if it's really hindering you, it's because you like it so much and you don't want to get rid of it. And it can be anything. It can be the people you hang out with. All right? Like it or not, you will be influenced by the people you surround yourselves with. You might, you might not see it right away, all right? but over time, you will start to resemble the crowd you run with. All right? So who do you run with? That doesn't mean isolate yourself completely from the world. We would never evangelize if we did that. All right? But it does mean the people that you allow to be closest to you, to influence you and have the most importance to you, you know, are they... Christians, do they share your faith? Are they there to support you or are they hindering you in your race? All right. Activities, you know, uh, how much screen time you put on, how much time you, you, you staring at your phone all day, how much time do you spend on Facebook or the, the beautiful thing about Wordle is they only put up one puzzle a day. So they can't, you know, otherwise I'd probably be on Wordle all day long, um, but you can't do that. Um, and obviously we have addictions. People have various different types of addictions. What is it that's hindering you? You ain't perfect. You ain't Jesus. I guarantee you have something, as do I. We all do. You need to do some self-reflection and ask, what is it that's preventing you from continuing to grow to the extent you can? Our sanctification, our growth to becoming more and more like Christ is a never-ending journey that we're all going through. And you continue to go through until the time you die. And so if you want to tell me there's nothing that's holding you back, I will call you a liar because that would mean that you've completely, you've, you finished, congratulations, you're just like Jesus. All right? You ain't. All right. All right. And then verses two and three says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Think of the race imagery. We are running a race as human beings here on earth. Did Jesus run that race? Sure did. He came to earth as human. He lived a human life. All right. Did he sin? No. So he successfully completed that race. And he's sitting at the finish line. All right. Literally sitting. We've talked about that imagery before in a previous passage. The author has mentioned, why is he seated? Because his work is done. Right. He doesn't have to keep offering sacrifices. He's finished. But using the race imagery... 
He's seated up there. If I'm running over there, and that's the finish line, I need to be keeping my eyes ahead. And this is a true story. I mean, I'm a cross-country runner. Well, not anymore, obviously. But I was a cross-country runner for much of my life. And I could never run track. I hated running track because um, like I, I was a distance runner. Anybody ever run indoor track as a distance runner? It's like, oh, look, you're going to go around a circle. And again, and again, and again, and again, and again. It's really, really boring. That's why I was like cross country, because I was outdoors and I could look ahead. Um, but sometimes when you're running a cross country race, like I'd be running, um, I ran a half marathon about five, six years ago, um, which is where I injured my knee and needed surgery, which is why I don't run anymore. But it was a trail race. I didn't know it was a trail race when I was getting into it. Um, I, I just, I don't know why I didn't read the, the, the write-up enough. It was like, oh, it's a half marathon. It's in Elkton. That's right up the road. I can do that. And then I get there and realize the entire thing is through the woods. And it's on these little tiny trails. That was the hardest race I'd ever run in my life. But when I'm running on these trails through the woods, I've got to keep my eyes straight ahead. Because if I start looking side to side, because I'm a nature guy, I like that, you know, you admire the woods around you, what's going to happen? I'm gonna, yeah, I'm going to fall. I'm going to trip over a tree root or something. I'm going to run to the runner next to me. And some of that, you're like, like sardines in those little things. Um, I've got to keep my eyes on where I'm going otherwise, and not get distracted by what's off to the side. Otherwise, I'm going to falter. I'm going to fall. The same imagery is being used here by the author of Hebrews. In this race of life that we are running, Jesus is at the finish line. All right? And we know what he did. So you need to be looking. It's kind of like he's your coach. You know, you ever seen a coach in a race that's cheering someone on? You want to focus on what the coach is saying to help you push through? Jesus is our coach. He's at the finish line. Keep your eyes on him. Don't look to the left. Don't look to the right because that's where you're going to get tempted and you're going to get off track. Keep your focus on Jesus at the finish line, remembering what he did, and that's going to help you persevere and push through. All right? He endured the cross, scorning his shame. That's another example for us. Um, if you died on a tree or, or a cross, which was seen as dying on a tree in Jewish tradition, you were viewed as being cursed by God. And in a sense, Jesus was, because he was bearing all of our sin, right, at the time. Uh, Deuteronomy 21, 23. So this was the most humiliating form of death for a, a, a Jewish man to undergo, and yet Jesus still willingly did it. And that's what that's referring to. All right. Verse 4, in your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. This is another memory test. We talked about this verse in a previous class. Does anybody remember what, why we talked about this verse? Because no one had died. No one had died, which helped us date the book. Remember, all the way back in, in class one, which if you don't remember, that one is online. Now you can go back and rewatch it. Um, because there were, we were trying to fig figure out when the book was written. And there were different times of Christian persecution in the first century around when this book might have been written. There was persecution of Claudius in AD 49, Nero in AD 60, and Domitian in the 80s and 90s. And yet those latter two involved death, all right? Christians getting executed. Claudius did not. It was the expulsion from Jerusalem and all of that. And so when we talk about the fact that you haven't resisted yet to the point of shedding your blood, nobody's died among this group yet, which makes it and most likely that this referred to, that this was written sometime between that Claudius persecution and the Nero, but before the Nero persecution, because you wouldn't tell somebody they hadn't died yet when they had, you know, some of them had. Um, but what's interesting, and this is, I didn't even catch this when I first read it, and this is something I saw in one of the commentaries, is that word yet. Didn't just say, but you, you have not resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Said you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And this again gets back to that point the author made before. God not only never promised that you're going to have a cushy life, he wants you to expect the possibility of the opposite. As a direct result of your faith, you may find yourself in some very uncomfortable and sticky situations. Are you going to stay true to God when that happens? We are spoiled in this country, folks. I mean, there are certainly attacks on Christianity in this country, and I'm not going to shy away from them. There absolutely are, and we speak up against them. Um, but n compared to some other great places in the world, where you come out as Christian, you're going to get beheaded? All right? We don't live in that kind of world, fortunately, um, or that part, part of the world. So we are spoiled in that regard. But understand that a lot of these first century Christians and a lot of Christians today are in exactly that position of having to have their faith tested that way. All right, verses 5 and 6. 
And have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son? It says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you. Because the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. All right. Now, don't read too much into this. All right. This is not saying that every single bad thing that happens to someone is a result of God disciplining, all right? Jesus made that clear. Remember, well, why did this person die? Was it because of his son or because of his parents? Uh, and the point is, that sometimes it's neither. Sometimes bad things just happen, okay? Um, but it's also a mistake to go too far the other direction. Sometimes the struggles and the difficulties and the bad things that we face are exactly because God is chastening us because we're on the wrong path, all right? Uh, I think it was C.S. Lewis who said something, I'm going to get the quote wrong, but it was uh, something along the lines, pain and suffering is God's way of getting the, the, our attention. It's his megaphone for arousing a, a deaf world. Um, sometimes, you know, we are going down the wrong path, and it's only by, well, facing the consequences of our wrong decisions that, God can steer us back on the right path. I think if we're honest with us, all of us have been in that situation where we've done something we shouldn't have done. It didn't turn out the way we would have preferred, and we learned something from it, right? If you haven't had that happen to you, go home today and put your hand on a hot burner, all right? I guarantee you, you won't put your hand on a hot burner. Don't, please don't really do that, okay? Um, but you get my point. We all have learned lessons that way. Um, and anybody who's had kids has realized that sometimes you discipline your children to get them on the wrong path because they're doing something wrong. Anybody ever have a kid right after you ground them say, thank you, mommy and daddy. I love the fact that you grounded me. I haven't spent enough quality time alone in my room. I'm going to assume that's a no. No. They don't like it when it happens, do they? But in hindsight, hopefully, when they grow up, they can see it was significant. And the reason you do it is not because you don't like them. You do it precisely because you love them. Why should we think God is any different? All right? Verses 7 and 8, endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Um, anybody heard this verse from Proverbs 13, 24? Whoever spares the rod hates the children, or spare the rod, spoil the child. You know. But the one who loves their children is careful to discipline them. All right? The author's hammering the point home. The fact that we are disciplined by God shows that he loves us. If you've never received discipline from God, then that may mean that you don't exactly have the relationship with God that you think you do. All right? Because if you do, then he will try to change you. It's like I said in, which one was it? It was the, uh, the Billy Joel sermon message that I gave a little while ago. Um, you know, that, yes, God does love you just the way you are. But that doesn't mean he wants to leave you just the way you are. He will try to change you, and sometimes that's going to involve painful experiences. You have to be willing to accept that. If you haven't endured that, then you got to question, you know, well, am I really with where I should be with God if I don't see myself changing? All right, verses 9 and 10. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father, and spirits and, uh, the Father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while, as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good, in order that we may share in his holiness. Again, parents discipline their children precisely because they love them. And again, not right away, but hopefully when kids get older, and when some of us maybe look on some of the things we've endured in our lives, we can look back on it and say, yeah, I, that, that, that was the right thing to do. I'm better off the result that they did that. You know, I'm a better person as a result of they did that. Um, well, if we can respect that, then shouldn't we be able to respect God's discipline, which is far superior? Because keep in mind, human discipline is never perfect. I mean, we would like to think we live in a world where every single parent solely disciplines their child, never out of anger, but solely out of correction and trying to steer them the right way, and they never get it wrong. You know, that every single time a kid comes and says, I'm not the one that stole the cookie from the cookie jar, that you guess right, all right? But occasionally we get it wrong, all right? 
I mean, if you ask my seventh graders and I, I get them in trouble, I'm always wrong. They're never the ones that did it. I, somehow I think that I'm usually right in that department. But, um, but yeah, if human parents are sometimes going to discipline for wrong motivations, we will do things out of anger sometimes, and we shouldn't because we're not perfect, all right? Sometimes human parents get it wrong. They discipline a kid for something, and you know, lo and behold, the kid actually didn't do it. It happens from time to time. Dave's thinking of a specific instance right now. He says, yeah, I remember that time, yeah. Um, <laughs> so I'll ask Sarah tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> but God knows everything. And God is just, and God is loving. He is the source of those attributes, all right? So his discipline is always perfect. So if we can respect discipline that's handed down by imperfect humans, shouldn't we all the more respect discipline that comes from God? And verse 11, no, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness. I love that, that imagery, a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Through discipline, we become more like Christ. It's not pleasant, but it's a beneficial at the end. And notice, I like that imagery too, trained by it. Undergoing discipline is like training. Think of like an athlete who's training for a, for a race or for a game or something. Training athletically is not an easy thing to do. You work your tail off. But if you do the training and you put in the work, you reap the benefits come game time, come race time. If you don't put in the training, then you lose. All right, that's how it works. All right. Verses 12 and 13, therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. I, I love that imagery, too, because, again, I, I was a long-distance runner. So this idea of you know, feeble arms and weak knees, especially the weak knees part as a runner, oh, I get that. I get that so much. I mean, there are times, you know, at, at the end of that race, you're, I mean, I got to tell you, when I ran that half marathon, um, I got to the 10 mile mark and I was like, I'm done. <laughs> I'm done. I can't, I can't do it anymore. You feel so weak. Your knees just want to give out on you. Everything wants to give out on you, which also is when I fell and tore the, the meniscus in my knee. But that's a different story. Um, I then finished running the last three miles which also might have complicated matters. You, know, you look back on retrospect. Um, but but you, you, I can identify that. And I think to some extent, whether you're an athlete or not, you know, we can all, whether it be physically, whether it be emotionally, whether it be spiritually, we've all gone through those times where we're just like, I, I got nothing left. I got nothing left. And so the author here is encouraging us to strengthen ourselves, to, get, to find strength in those moments. Where do we find strength? By looking to our coach. You know, remember, look at, look at that finish line. There's Jesus cheering you on, showing you exactly what you, could, you should be doing, showing you by example how he lived his life here on earth. So it's just like, anybody ever seen the movie uh, Facing the Giants? Ever seen that one? Yeah. That's a wonderful scene in that movie, and you probably know where I'm going with this, where they had the, the, the death crawl, I think it was called, where they, they would, one of the football players would get down, and another football player would get on their back. And the football player on the ground was supposed to crawl as far as they could with this player on their back. And the coach was trying to encourage this one player who didn't think was giving him his all, wasn't giving him everything he could. And so he said, you're going to do the death crawl, but you're going to do it blindfolded. And, and he blindfolded, so he couldn't see how far he'd gone, all right? And he says, well, I can, you know, he put this guy on my back, I can probably get to the, to the 20. The coach said, I think you can get to the 50. Um, and says, but I don't want you, I don't want you giving up until you've, you've got nothing left. I want, and, and so the, the, they're doing this death crawl, and the coach the whole time is there cheering them on, cheering them on, encouraging them, move, 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 move. And then the kid finally collapses, and he says, this has got to be the 50. It's got to be the 50. And they start on one, on one side of the field, and they, they go the other way. And he said, Brock, take off, your, take off your blindfold. You're in the end zone. And he went the entire distance of the field with this kid on his back. And that's the encouragement. Sometimes if we strip away the things that you know, are getting in the way, and that's what the blindfold was for, right? That this kid was letting his, his own head get to him, all right? And he had convinced himself, I can only go so far. So the coach knew as long as the kid could see how far he was going to go, that was going to be holding him back. Got to get rid of that. And then on top of that, the coach was encouraging him the entire time. All right? That's a real, that scene is a great model for our, our walk with Christ and our walk in our life. All right, 
The other thing that's interesting, if you look at the New Revised Standard Version translation of these verses, it says, then those who follow you, though they are weak and lame, will not stumble and fall, but will become strong. Uh, so it has this additional idea of those, that we're doing this because there are those who are following us, behind us. And the question I ask there, I, I point out here, the world is watching you. Your fellow Christians are watching you. What kind of message are you sending if they see you giving up when times get tough? I mean, understand, we all go through these tough times, but I hate to put it this so bluntly, but it ain't all about you. All right? People are watching you, whether you realize it or not, whether they, they say it or not. All right? And if they see you give up, what do you think they're going to do when times get tough? Then they're going to give up. All right? Which is also why, going full circle, God wants us all to be in community so we can be encouraging each other. All right? That's the point. That's why you can't do it on your own. All right, verse 14. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. All right? Now, does this mean we should, comp for the sake of keeping peace with everybody, that we should compromise God's truth? No. All right? But this is why 1 Peter 3.15 says, Always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. You can stand up for the truth and still be gentle and respectful to people around you. So as much as you, it's within your control, and obviously what other people do is not within your control, but as much as it's within your control, you're supposed to live at peace with everyone. Not just with fellow believers in your church, although we all have seen instances of relationships in churches that are not what they should be, all right? but also with non-believers. Right? With the world, you should be trying, striving to do everything you can to live in peace. All right? Uh, now, and the other thing that is kind of interesting is this even includes people who have done something wrong with, to you. All right? you should, that doesn't mean you, you don't learn lessons from it. It doesn't mean you have to stay in bad relationships, all of that, uh, that you don't learn from it. But it does mean that you should not be you know, snowballing. You should not be contributing to it. Uh, and you should still be trying to live in peace. And this is the, the honest reflection point. There is nothing anyone has done to you here on earth that is anywhere as bad as what you have done to God. And yet God still sent his son to die for you. So how are you treating God if you refuse to treat kindly to others with kindness just because they've done something wrong to you that you don't like? It's almost like I don't know. Isn't there some kind of prayer that we say in church on Sundays that says something about, you know, forgive us our sins? What's the next part again? Oh, come on, louder than that. You say it. Come on. You don't want to say it. What is it? As we forgive those who sin against us. Yeah. Same point here. All right. The same point is here. All right. We're also called to be holy. Now, what this is referring to, there's two, two, two ways of taking this. Obviously, we're all declared holy when we become believers. And this is what we've talked about before, that you know, Jesus was perfect. Jesus died to pay the penalty for your sin. So on the day of judgment, God's looking at you. Actually, Jesus is the one who does the judging, too. That's the beautiful thing about this. He's both the one that saved you and the judge at the same time. Um, but when you're being judged and God's looking at you, seeing what your sins are, it's like Jesus steps in front, so God's actually seeing his perfection instead of your imperfection. So you are declared holy in that sense. Like, his holiness is assigned to you. Does that mean you are perfectly holy? Again, if you say yes, you're a liar, and then that's just provided more example that you're not really holy. Um, no, we go throughout our lives, we become more and more like Christ. So there is a striving, there is a, the Holy Spirit is helping to change who we are. And so that's what this is talking about here. It's something called sanctification. That's the big theological term, all right, sanctification. All right, so we are called not just to be declared holy, but to work toward becoming more and more like Christ throughout our lives. All right, verse 15, see to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. All right, see to it that no one falls short. Oh, look, there it is again. Christians are supposed to look after each other. We're supposed to live in community. All right, another one of the messages I gave recently, I, I don't remember which one it was, um, where I, I mentioned the fact that we are supposed to, what's the word I used? I, it was a great, it's a, just go back and look, it's probably better in the message. But the idea was that we are called to call each other out, 
that we are called. And you need to understand that you need to be willing to accept that. If your fellow Christian says, I think you're on the wrong path, now they should do it gracefully, all right? But if they say that, then you need to listen and evaluate, am I really on that wrong path? And, and take it with the loving, hopefully the loving spirit in which it's intended. Um, and the same thing here. It's that, that's why the Christian community is so important to keep us on the straight and narrow. The flip side of that coin, another function of living in community, is that last part. No, see to it that no bitter root grows up. This is, this is imagery, again, that these Jewish Christians would have recognized. This comes straight out of Deuteronomy 29, 19. Make sure there is no man or woman, clan or tribe among you today, whose heart turns away from the Lord our God to go and worship the gods of those nations. Make sure there is no root among you that produces such bitter poison. All right? So, in addition to saying, hey, your job is to make sure that your fellow believers aren't falling short, you know, aren't going down the wrong path, it's also to make sure that you don't have somebody who is not a believer, all right, unbelievers in the church that are delivered, you know, a, a, one bad seed can, can grow. It's not going to be as obvious right away, but we've got to, we can't be afraid to call it out. You know, if the Bible is God's word and whatever you're hearing taught in, in your church is contrary to the Bible, then we need to put the kibosh on that. Right? And that is our job as Christians. All right? Because if you don't, and you don't weed it out right away, I'm not going to call out any particular denominations by name, but um, I think we can all think of examples today of churches that claim to be Christian, and you've got to wonder, where the heck is Jesus in your church? It's just not there. You become a social club, at best. All right, all right verses 16 and 17. See that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Afterward, as you know, when he wanted to inherit this blessing, he was rejected. Even though he sought the blessing with tears, he could not change what he had done. All right? This is a passing comment, but one that is, we see throughout the Bible in different places. Again, it's a warning about sexual immorality. Author doesn't go into specifics here, um, but the point is pretty much all kinds of sexual immorality. We can all think of the, the profound damage that it does. All right? Think about the effect on a marriage of sexual immorality. Think of the damage to relationships, families, communities, churches. Um, I struggled with whether I was going to tell this story today, but I will. Um, I had a, uh, a a pastor about how old am I now? Uh, this was probably twenty years ago. Um, was not just my pastor; he was a very good friend. All right, and I was an elder in the church. Uh, it was my old denomination. I was actually an ordained elder, and. Um, yeah, we used to, my wife used to, to joke, because we'd have him come over to the, to the house sometimes, and I'd go over to his house, and she used to say that uh, I liked to have him around because I could have all these theological conversations that everybody else, their eyes just glaze over. But, you know, he and I, we were like that. You know, we could go back and forth. Um, and it, it was great. And then I got a call one night, and I said, uh, and I, it, it was him, and he said, I need you to come to the church at, you know, 5 o'clock tomorrow or something like that. I uh, can't tell you why. I just need you to come to the church. So I, I went to the church at 5 o'clock the next day, and I, I saw two other elders were there. Um, and there was someone from the denomination that was there. And, and then he, it was a confession. And he had been caught um, viewing child pornography on the church computer. Um, he was arrested, and whole legal thing uh, ensued from that. Um, but there was... The damage that was done by that was obviously a, a, a personal, a lot of personal damage to me. And you know, so I, I can see. Fortunately, I did not go down this path. A lot of people have things like that, and it makes you doubt the faith to begin with. But I was well grounded enough to see that you know, no matter how what I, how I felt about this man, um, he was a man. He wasn't God. My faith was in Jesus, not in a pastor. But it was still hurtful. And I will say there was a lot of struggles within that church because they. Um, you know, you had some people that says, well, aren't we supposed to forgive? Can't we just, you know, keep letting him be pastor? And you know, other people saying, um, no, yes, we forgive, but there are also certain standards that you have to hold your pastors to. Um, and so there was a lot of division within the church itself. And so part of the reason God holds up this sexual immorality 
uh, repeatedly hammers home, we, we have to stamp out sexual morality, is because more than a lot of other types of sins that are out there, this one can really be damaging. It can be really damaging. Um, really quickly, just to finish up these last two verses, and then we'll do the rest of chapter 12 next week when we finish up with chapter 13. Uh, but the rest of the other thing it talks about here is Esau. Esau, sold for a single meal, sold his inheritance rights of the oldest son. Uh, remember, we talked uh, a few weeks ago, I think, I think it was this class, again, they all run together, uh, about the birthright. Did I talk to you guys about birthright, what the birthright is? Yeah, that the birthright was this special privilege that it was, generally went to the eldest son, get a double portion of the inheritance and all of that. Um, well, Esau, actually, you know, Jacob's like, hey, you know, I got this great meal. How about, you know, I get you this meal and you, I'll make you this meal and you give me your birthright in exchange. Well, he's, Esau's an idiot. And so he said, sure, because he was hungry. I mean, that's basically what it is. You know, he was hungry, and so he said uh, he sold away. That, that just shows that he didn't value the spiritual benefit of this blessing um, of the birthright and what it, what it entailed. And so he gave it away for the stupidest of reasons. And that shows you how much he valued it or didn't value it. All right? Uh, and then, of course, afterwards, he regretted his decision, but it was irreversible. And so he tried to go back and get it back but in tears, but he, it couldn't be done. All right? Similarly, in the point the author is making here, Jesus is the only way to salvation, right? I am the way, the truth, the life. If people reject that one way, there is no going back, all right? A time is going to come when, you know, separating the, the sheep from the goats. The time's going to come when judgment's going to happen. Those who are in Christ are going to inherit their eternal blessings. Those who are not, are not, all right? And that's a reality that, you know, it might not be pleasant to face, but it's one that we have to face, all right? And it's one that also, I think, makes me, you know, sometimes I reflect upon. It's like, okay, am I living my life in my relationships as if that were true? You know, we all know people who are not believers, you know? How do they, how, do they know about your faith? What kind of example are you setting? What are you doing? You know, and that's, that's uh, that, the answer to that question kind of shows, well, how seriously do we take the, the, this reality. I mean, we see through Esau, we see that if we don't take it seriously, you know, it can't be undone. And um, yeah, so anyway, that's just an interesting story to reflect upon and, and the seriousness of this irreversible decision um, or irreversible ramifications of, of rejecting Jesus Christ.